So I wanna welcome you guys all to the Corporate Strategy Masterclass on Resource Reallocation. We're really excited to have with us here today, Tim Fulta and Brian Wu. And um, as, as Ryan mentioned, my name is Katie Mogelson. I'm an assistant professor at London Business School. And so for these, um, these resource reallocation um, class, this is actually part of a larger uh, series that the Corporate Strategy Interest Group has put on. And so the goal of the series is to provide an overview of fundamental topics in corporate strategy um, with panelists that have deep expertise in the area. And so uh, this series, we've had sessions on evolution of corporate strategy, diversification, organizational design, theories of the firm. And for this session, we're focusing on resource reallocation. And upcoming in the fall, we'll have a session on mergers and acquisitions. And I want to say a big thank you to our organizer, uh, Elisa Alvarez Garrido. She's an assistant professor of international business at Darla Moore School of Business. And so uh, we're really happy that she was able to uh, do all the effort to put this session together and make it possible. So thank you, Elisa. And today we are privileged to have with us Tim Fulta, who's a professor of the School of Business at the University of Connecticut. Um, Tim's research examines both entrepreneurship and corporate strategy, and he analyzes decisions around entry, exit, and diversification. And his research focuses on the role of corporate headquarters in multi-business firms in reallocating strategic resources across businesses. And then we also have with us here, Brian Wu, who has research examining the dynamics of corporate scope and the evolution of industries. He's a professor of strategy at Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. So we're really happy to have you guys both with us here today. And um, just a quick announcement, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have Tim present first, and then Brian will do a presentation. After that, we will open it up to broader Q&A. So with that, I would like to hand it off to Tim. Okay, it's a pleasure and an honor to be part of this masterclass series and to be paired with Brian, whom, who holds my admiration. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed all the previous classes and really look forward to employing them, especially in my PhD teaching. Uh, today's topic is resource allocation, uh, or more specifically, resource redeployment. Uh, and this theme was featured by Connie Hilfat in the first SMS masterclass. And Brian and I were asked to dive into it a bit more. Uh, in particular, uh, what I'd like to do is emphasize that firms having potential to redeploy should have extra value tied to the flexibility to choose whether to source resources uh, internally or use external markets to source them. And this, this extra value might be the basis uh, for corporate advantage and has important implications for firm value, uh, for firm boundaries uh, and strategic change embodied in decisions like entry and exit and expansion and retrenchment. And, uh, and as Katie mentioned, I, I think it qualifies as a fundamental issue in strategic management because of those things. So it, it goes without saying uh, that my comments reflect insights gained with all my co-authors on this topic, some of whom are here today, so welcome and thank you. Uh, and it certainly, um, it, uh, I certainly have benefited from the editors. Uh, Connie and Brian, I know, have been two of the most prominent editors on my papers and, and, and all the referees along the way. So I'd like to just draw your attention to a couple of publications that you might find val valuable if you're interested in this topic. Uh, if you need copies, uh, please send me a note. <clears throat> okay, I wanna share a recent photo of a path in my garden. Um, what is the path I will take today? Well, essentially I wanna just kind of highlight my interpretation of resource redeployment. I wanna talk about the precedents uh, and the, some of the current work uh, that's being done. I, I wanna kind of discuss what we think we know about the topic of resource redeployment and why it's pertinent uh, to the corporate strategists in the room and in practice. And uh, finally, I wanna emphasize some research opportunities. 
So let's start uh, with what res resource redeployment is not. It's not synergy uh, where a resource is simultaneously shared across businesses. Uh, redeployment is the partial or complete withdrawal of resources uh, from one, one business, um, uh, withdrawal of tangible, intangible, and human capital resources from one use and reallocation to another. So, um, what are some of the other key features of redeployment? Um, it's necessary, we think, because some resources have capacity constraints, meaning they have opportunity costs. Otherwise, why not just simultaneously share? Uh, it's also an explicit choice made by managers to prefer internal markets to external markets as a mechanism to retrench resources from one opportunity to pursue another. Um, redeployment of non-financial resources uh, nearly always entails some switching costs, some adjustment costs, and these might involve retraining employees, adapting buildings or equipment, uh, transitioning personnel between uses or locations, or may involve indirect expenses stemming from business disruption or the amount of time involved in resource transfer. It, it typically refers to reallocations across businesses in a multi-business firm portfolio, but it may also occur across geographies or product lines uh, or even business models. Uh, resource redeployment can certainly be implemented without regard to external transaction costs, but it's the relationship between internal adjustment costs and external transaction costs that should determine whether redeployments are value creating versus value destroying. And, and finally, I just want to distinguish between redeployment uh, and redeployability, which is the flexibility derived from having the potential uh, to redeploy. Okay, uh, there's, an ex there's extraordinary momentum investigating these issues uh, and doctoral students contemplating a dissertation topic might, make, might take special note uh, when extraordinary scholars like Connie Helfat and Kathy Eisenhart and Dan Leventhal attend to a topic. So let me just highlight a few of the papers in this emergent stream. Uh, Miller and Yang observed that firms have many simultaneous instances of product exit and entry suggesting they're likely to be vacating product lines to redeploy resources to better opportunities. Uh, Bellinson and Solomon, one of my favorite papers, finds rates of human capital redeployment higher uh, when firms compete in countries with stronger employment protection, suggesting that market frictions and resource illiquidity are really important determinants. Chauvin and Poliquin, a working paper, find that in a Brazilian sample, uh, most human capital redeployments do not, do not coincide with exit or entry, uh, but really exemplify partial redeployments in the growth businesses. And Santa Maria um, uh, recognizes that portfolio entrepreneurs might benefit from redeployment, and he shows that portfolio entrepreneurs are more likely to exit ventures than single venture entrepreneurs. And by the way, I have a doctoral student, Jenna Rodriguez, who's doing some qualitative work on the same topic. Um, the origin of a stream is called its source. And uh, I just want to highlight that this stream source is a product of some of our field's seminal figures. Uh, again, to highlight only a few, um, Penrose emphasizes how efficient resource allocation drives diversification. Uh, the case studies of Chandler anticipate the importance of resource adjustment costs in determining strategic change. Uh, Ansoff 
and co-author suggests since a firm's businesses are often at risk, maintaining internal flexibility is fundamental so as to quickly and efficiently transfer resources and capabilities across businesses if needed. And uh, Kogut and Kula Talaka uh, first characterize resource flexibility as a switching option. So let's see, what do we think we know about resource redeployment? What do we think we know about resource redeployment? And why does it deserve more attention from corporate strategists going forward? Uh, let me emphasize a few ideas that particularly resonate with me. First, we think we know that firms with redeployable resources have added flexibility. Note, it, it, it's not merely that resources are fungible. Uh, it's that a firm can choose whether to use internal or external markets to access resources. And we believe that single business firms lack this same level of flexibility because their only option to access resources is the external market. Here's an example. h and is a single business firm. Uh, they, if they have an underperforming store, they have to sell the store in the external market. Inditex, is a firm with multiple businesses, two of which are depicted here. Uh, in the event of low performance in a pull and bear, for example, uh, Inditex can either sell the store in the external market or redeploy to Zara. So we know in practice that firms often exercise this option. Uh, there is a lot of an anecdotal evidence on this topic, including the many firms during the pandemic who use idle capacity to manufacture PP&E. Here's another example. Um, uh, let's see, Federated owns uh, three different chains and their, um, their Stern store wasn't doing very well. So they ended up getting out of Stearns and they redeployed 19 to Bloomingdale's or Macy's and they sold off some others. Um, so note that redeployment's not merely a way to escape, escape declining businesses, but also a way to exploit new opportunities and, and both are key to, to strategy. A second thing we think we know is that if redeployment might be a low cost alternative, it follows that sunk costs for pursuing opportunities might be lower. Um, so Dixit has shown that sunk costs affect investment in divestment thresholds. If we extend that thinking to redeployable resources, then it follows that having them also affects thresholds. This is important to strategy because it will make firms more likely to enter for a given level of expected performance and more likely to exit for a given level of performance. Thus, redeployable resources might help firms experiment more readily we should see firms with more redeployable resources entering and exiting opportunities more readily or expanding and retrenching more often. I find this to be a powerful idea. So let me show you some evidence along. Okay, so a third thing we think we know is that, uh, that resource scalability affects incentives to redeploy. So the, the theory really helps to advance uh, resource-based theory and our understanding of what types of resources and capabilities should be reallocated and which type should be shared. And Brian has a tremendous amount to say on this issue, so I will, I'll leave it to him. But let me just say, I find the idea of resource opportunity costs to be quite powerful. So corporate, um, corporate advantage is the holy grail in our field and it's possible that redeployment illuminates our understanding of it. 
um, we, we, we think actually that it's a, a separate explanation uh, of when multi-business firms uh, create corporate advantage. Let me share some results from a paper just accepted in SMJ. Um, so we argue that uncertainty should drive up the value of the redeployment option and find evidence that this is the case. Increases in uncertainty coincide with market returns that are over twice as large for multi-business firms compared to single business firms. And these results also suggest on the left-hand side that that disadvantage obtains when uncertainty declines. So there's a temporal aspect to corporate advantage when it's tied to redeployability. Uh, and interestingly, this work, although not depicted here, also found that these effects are accentuated when firms have more negatively correlated businesses and when firms have a redeployment capability. Finally, um, we think we understand some key components of what drives redeployability. We think it's tied uh, to switching costs when they're lower, when external markets are less efficient, and when there are inducements exacerbated by uncertainty about the relative advantage of portfolio opportunities. So um, for PhD students, there, remain, there remains a lot um, of theoretical and empirical work uh, in this space that's needed and to help us distinguish the truth uh, about redeployment. Uh, on the theoretical side, uh, I'm really intrigued by the potential of redeployment capability or what Thies et al. referred to as agility. Uh, surely redeployment flexibility is a function of more than just market forces and resource attributes. Uh, while the paper I just mentioned um, finds some evidence of a resource capability, uh, more work is needed here. We need a better understanding of how and, and whether redeployment of non-financial resources is different uh, from the internal capital market story. Uh, moreover, clearly there's some interaction between these two types of resources. So much work is needed to figure this out. And this has obvious empirical implications. More clarity is also needed, uh, I think, for understanding when redeployment might be a feature of single business firms. Uh, for example, they can redeploy from their business uh, to another new business. So how is it different from a firm currently present in two businesses? More clarity is needed there. Uh, Ansoff and co-author allude to the importance of structuring a firm for redeployment. So, so what are the structures and incentives needed to efficiently achieve this? And, and what are the opportunity costs associated with those structures and incentives. Moreover, how does ownership and governance alter the redeployment algorithm? This is relatively unchartered territory. And we're learning that behavioral biases bear upon many strategic decisions. Surely they also play a role in redeployment as does opportunism. Uh, on the empirical side, a, a key challenge for me has always been uh, to observe redeployments. Uh, and we do our best. Uh, we look for outcomes that might obtain if our theory is correct, an approach taken by, by lots of empiricists. Uh, but we sure could get closer to the truth if there was an accounting of non-financial redeployment. At the same time, redeployments need not obtain for flexibility of value to accrue. I wanna emphasize that. So, so I don't wanna to place too much, um, too much weight on observation of redeployment events. And, and this is why Arkady Sakhartov uh, resorts to theoretical models um, 
finally, uh, distinguishing between synergy and redeployment is, is important if we want to drive at the truth. Uh, uh, there's really a wealth of evidence uh, on the providence of synergy, but I'm quite concerned that much of the accumulated evidence obfuscates synergy and redeployment. Uh, more work is needed to distinguish these two explanations of corporate advantage and firm scope. So um, I've spent enough time probably. Thanks so much for your attention. We probably covered too much ground in such a short period of time, but, but on the other hand, not enough uh, because of obvious limitations. So I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. That was really great. Um, Ryan, uh, you're welcome to share your screen whenever you're ready. Hello. Hi, um, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, participating in our uh, master class. Um, I want to uh, start by thanking uh, Elisa, uh, Katie uh, for organizing this event. And I know that uh, you have a lot of things going on. And uh, also thank uh, Ryan for uh, managing the whole process. And especially I'm honored to be paired with uh, Tim. Uh, We've we'll known each other for a long time, and we sometimes have a little discussion or debate in some way. So today is a wonderful opportunity, um, and we coordinate a little bit, right? So, uh, so, so that we cover more ground as uh, as much as possible, right? Uh, Tim mentioned. So, I want to start with a basic question: you know, what is strategy, right? I, I think um, this kind of a question uh, is very useful uh, to uh, situate, right? Uh, today's class in the sense that um, we see from the classic definition of, uh, by Chandler, right? So you have the classic book, strategy and structure, right? So you can see that the allocation of resources, right? Plays a, a central role, right? I would say uh, in the definition of strategy, right? So I think um, uh, oftentimes it's a very useful to go back to the classic work, right? So uh, sometimes students ask me to recommend a book. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I, I, I have no clue what to recommend, right? And then I just pretend I'm very deep you know, as a professor or advisor. And I would you know, go to my bookshelf you know, pick up something from like at least 50 years ago, right? So, and then you know, recommend to them to show that I'm very knowledgeable. But, but really, um, you know, and then in retrospect, I realized that you know there is a selection effect, right? So the fact that they stay in our uh, bookshelf for so long, right, it probably means that there is always something there. Uh, it's worth going back to revisit. At the same time, you know, uh, certainly, you know, we, 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 you know, we shouldn't be superstitious, right? So uh, later in my presentation, I want to share how we can even challenge the thoughts, let's say, by you know. The, our pioneering scholars like Chandler even, right? So these are all research opportunities. You know, the first, uh, 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 actually now the second, the second question is what are the resources? What are our resources, right? Uh, again, go back to, to, to another classic uh, book, uh, Penrose, right? So you can see several uh, key points here, uh, collection of productive resources, right? So we sometimes call that uh, resource bundles. Right. Um, the second is the disposable of which between different uses and time. I think that relates to what a, a team just shared in some way, right? So different uses and over time, right? So a redeployment or reallocation, et cetera. But to me, an uh, interesting question is, you know, really, right? So again, when we teach, right? So give me a few examples, you know, what are the uh, what resources we talk about here? Right? I mean, think about the financial capital, right? Is a resource or data, right? So nowadays, you know, big data and the algorithm, right? Uh, that, 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 you know, kind of utilize data to, to, to generate insights, patent, right? And the AI engineers, especially those with the domain knowledge, you know, nowadays they are probably the most valuable resources. And Amazon's, you know, physical warehouse storage, right? I mean, I mean, of course, there are other dimensions we can uh, 
you know, use to examine these resources. But uh, going back to today's uh, class, right? Let's think about, do these resources need to be allocated? Right, it sounds like an obvious question, right? Because that's exactly what the Chandler said, right? So, you know, you allocate the resources or Penrose said, right? So he supposed them between different times, uh, uh, uses and over time. The reason I ask this question is, you know, next slide I will provide more details. Because if you just think about that, for example, knowledge or algorithm, probably they don't need to be allocated. Right, so you know this idea is not works, right? It's a sort of a public good within firm boundary, right? And if in fact, in some sense, if you don't worry about intellectual property, it's probably you know for the whole society, right? But on the other hand, some other resources in the warehouse, right? AI engineers that actually design the algorithms probably need to be allocated. So what's going on here, right? As I said, right? So I'm not denying there are many other important dimensions to examine these resources. I'm just saying, right? So when it comes to resource allocation, I think it's useful to, to think a, a little deeper about the attributes, right? So resource attributes, right? That, that influence uh, uh, resource allocation or reallocation. You know, the team just not talk about it, redeployability, you know, a, a number of factors. I think that that's what this literature nowadays, you know, try to, uh, put forward. So, so I want to go back to uh, 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 you know, my dissertation almost, you know, many, many years ago. So, so my advisor, you know, Dan, you know, uh, it's so funny. It's, it's, uh, I, 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 I tend to uh, at least uh, pretend to be a, a new classical uh, e economist in some way, right? So at least when I was a student, right? So, so I mean, students tend to, oh, you know, be a uh, influenced too much by uh, uh, you know those seemingly scientific you know economic stuff right so that's what me so you know we had this discussion about sort of the question we talk about right and, and then if you think about it you know on one dimension you have fungibility which you know the strategy literature talk a lot relatedness very much right fungible means that uh, you know uh, you, you know whether you know, resources are applicable in another domain, right? So when they originally developed in one domain, whether they are applicable when you use them in another domain, right? Think about, um, uh, let's say, for example, you know, the team of auditors. Auditors means that, I mean, it's about auditing, right? So more or less they are fungible, right? So in business one versus business two, versus the example I gave, right? So engineers with specific domain knowledge, right? Probably less fungible, right? Werner Feld Montgomery had research along this dimension, right? Showing that as a firm diversifying into more distant market, the top is Q, right? So value will drop inevitably, even though the firm rationally do that to, to diversify, right? So that the best or, uh, utilize their resources to the uh, most extent. But the other, on the other hand, you think about the opportunity cost, right? So in terms of the question I raised just now, you know, some resources like a patent, brand name, right? Relationship, right? Or algorithm, right? Well, you know, they just scale free in the sense that, you know, if you use them in another domain, right? So the current domain not affected, right? That's what we call public good. Right. Of course, later we, we, or air even, right? The air we breathe, right? It's a really public good. Although, as I said later, right? So later we are going to talk about congestion, right? So when there is a pollution, of course, right? So, you know, that, but that's a different matter. But, but at the abstract level, right? Different resources have different degrees of uh, opportunity costs, right? So of course, this is like a very abstract, you know, some just a zero, right? Some, you know, have big opportunity costs. Right? And this is true, not just for, you know, diversification and vertical integration, but also for global strategy, right? Katie's work, you know, uh, you know it's, uh, it, you know, some McDonald's brand probably apply in all different countries, but, but those managers, right? So attention or, you know, some other resources need to be allocated based on opportunity costs and the market opportunities. So, and then the next question, again, it, it's uh, another, almost like a, a silly question or basic question, right? So what is the opportunity cost, right? So I actually went back to the classic finance textbook, right? The finance textbook uh, uh, told us that, uh, you know, uh, opportunity cost is 
in, in uh, use quotation marks, right? They expect the return that investors can achieve in financial markets at the same level of risk. Right? So that's a one definition. The second definition is economics and strategy literature in the sense that, um, you know, I, I think there are this uh, understanding that um, resources can be firm specific, right? So especially going back to Klein, Crawford, Alchin's classic uh, article and the Peter Roth's classic article, right? If they are specific to certain firms, now, the opportunity cost of using it in the Foucault firm, right? Should be the value to these resources, second highest bidder outside the firm, right? So there is a, a nuanced difference, right? Because in finance literature, there is no disconsideration. Money is money, right? So, so money is not specific to any firm, right? Uh, but for uh, especially strategy literature, this recognition of firm specificity plays a very important role, right? Uh, in creating this wedge. But nonetheless, you know, if you think about the existing finance and econ strategy literature, right? So the definition is still about the value resources to the Foucault firm and the next best user in the external market outside the firm. So now, if you think about it, the third possibility is that opportunity can also be within firm boundary. If a firm is, has multiple uh, business, businesses, right? Or multiple activities, not necessarily business lines, but the activities in the sense that the next best use right, determined as the firm's other initiatives. And especially as I will later explain, right? How these initiatives are organized Right. Uh, so, so in this sense, you know, I, I'm writing this new essay with with Dan uh, Leventhal. So the idea is to use opportunity cost as a sort of a unifying structure or uni, uni core construct, right? To link you know, strategy with structure. Right? So that's again it goes back to Chandler's classic book, right? So again, there are many other ways to to do that, right? So we are just saying that. You know, maybe opportunity cost again from the resource allocation perspective, right? So it might be a useful construct to think about, you know, strategy and structure, uh, how they come together. So just to, uh, give a, a preliminary uh, illustration, right? Just just preliminary uh, thinking um, that that we have. You know, I mentioned the fungibility issue, right? But uh, I, I think what's interesting also could be uh, a comparability. Comparability means that, uh, you know, to what extent firms can use a variety of operating metrics, all right, to compare alternative possibilities or opportunities, right? So I, I, here I just want, want us to focus on, let's say, the upper right corner, right? So upper right corner, you know, let's say um, digital uh, photography, right, or digital newspaper. So in some sense, that capabilities, the digital capabilities, are very much fungible, right? It's, uh, you know, in fact, I remember Kodak, right? A chemical-based uh, field firm invented the first digital camera. And same for Polaroid, right? So they actually possess fungible digital capabilities. But the challenge for resource allocation very often is comparability, right? Comparability here means that you know, let's say the new business utilize, uh, no longer utilize the uh, razor and the blade uh, business model, just like the old business model, right? And then the new business follow a different matrix, right? So maybe they pursue growth versus the old business pursue profit margin, just for example, right? So when comparability is low, that creates a lot of challenges for resource allocation, right? I mean, again, this idea is still under development. So we are still working on it. But um, going back to also a team's uh, uh, point earlier, right? So to push the uh, uh, standard constructs like relatedness even further, right? So how do we further decompose them? And how can we, you know, find a better measure? Especially nowadays, uh, you know, so-called big data. I, I think the big data is not about the end, right? So it's so, so a large number, I mean, a zillion data points. And whenever I see a zillion data points, I'm like, you know, what's the value? As a reviewer, as an editor, I'm not so 
<laughs> impressed, right? It, it, it only increase your your or decrease your standard error, right? But but really, I think big data is about you know better data. I think right. So 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 you know so, so a lot of ideas that we theorized before, but now I think there are opportunities to capture them empirically, uh, and, and the correlation cost. Uh, since I mentioned the organization structure and other. Uh, initiatives within the firm boundaries. I think we need to think about the, the relationship with the coordination, coordination, coordination costs, excuse me. So uh, again, so our perspective here is a very specific relation to our uh, conceptualization. But it, 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 our thoughts, the idea is that, you know, first of all, you know, coordination costs can be interpreted in different ways. Right, so the classic work by coast, right? So communication, right? So the cost of a communication, you know, the coordination. So the, that that's a basic way of thinking about the coordination cost. And more recently, we, you know, let's say my uh, co-authors, more Asim and I, developed this model, extending the uh, you know NK model from one landscape to two landscapes, right? So that allows us to examine, right? So. Uh, in order to let's say search for uh, some sort of a global optimum, right? For the whole system requires some optimizing for a subsystem, right? So there's another uh, way of thinking about the coordination cost. But either way, you know the relationship between coordination cost and uh, opportunity cost, you know, in this setting, could be that coordination cost is one type of uh, opportunity cost, right? So when you want to do something else, especially in a certain way, right? So, so the current business need to sacrifice. Um, so uh, this one, I won't elaborate. Uh, by the way, you probably have noticed, right? So uh, I didn't go into depth of each topic, right? So for uh, my part of a presentation, I try to, you know, at least uh, bring attention to these uh, constructs, you know, other important constructs with resource allocation, right? So that's my purpose. So exploration, exploitation, right? Here, again, uh, very basically, why there is a trade-off between exploration and exploitation? Because you know, there's an opportunity cost, right? Explore, probably you, you, you have to stop exploiting or, or reduce your exploitation, right? Because otherwise, if you really try to ambidextrous all the time, if you are able to do that, then that become a tautology. Meaning that right, it's a, become a very simple search process, right? So you search, you make incremental investment until you know the direct cost of search is covered, right? It's kind of break even uh, idea, right? And, and even uh, real options, right? Real options, let's say for for uh, for uh, let's see a single um, project versus the real option in the context of a uh, corporate business portfolio when there are other um, uh, 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 business opportunities that require investment, right? And not to mention when these opportunities unfold over time, right? It become hyper nested the real options approach, uh, almost like a like a Bellman. You know, it's a curse of dimensionality, right? It's impossible to solve. Right? The, uh, but but again, here I, I quickly mention this because I want to make this a reminder, right? So uh, and, and then. What about organization structure? As I said, I won't go into details, but I just want to give an example to think about how organization structure can change opportunity costs, even holding constant, you know, everything else like a size, you know, a total resources, etc. Right? Just to think about, you know, let's say four businesses, right? If you group them all together, right, or into two. And more, or more interestingly, three versus one, everything else the same, right? Would, let's say, uh, let's say a single business, right? Uh, receive the same uh, uh, amount of uh, resources, right? Uh, you know, organization structure matters, right? And uh, especially when there is uh, imperfect uh, decomposability, right? Um, you know, the incentives, the conflicts, right? So I think uh, this, or the, or the intersection of opportunity cost and the organization structure would be a useful way to revisit many uh, topics like a diversification, spin-off, disrupt innovation, etc. Uh, 
So last but not least, I want to talk about the, you know, the theory of the firm from resource allocation perspective. The team mentioned this already, right? So uh, Sharon's work, you know, the, uh, uh, Juan Santalo, Marco, you know, all the people, you know, Kim's own work, right? Here's a very simple uh, conceptualization in the sense that, um, you know, I, just now I alluded to this idea within firm opportunity cost versus across from uh, opportunity cost or resource allocation, right? So, I mean, just consider a marketer, right? Human resource is also resource, right? If this person moves from, let's say, one business to a second business, so let's say, uh, consumer goods to healthcare versus from P&G to uh, Johnson Johnson, the same business, right? I mean, similar thing for global strategies, right? I mean, a very basic idea to think about is what's the cost or opportunity cost, right? Influenced by organization structure, influenced by other you know, political uh, dynamics within the organization versus the cost of moving uh, across different firms within the same business, right? So in that sense, that can also um, not necessarily, as we argued, right, determine the optimal firm boundary, but it can definitely demonstrate in you know, a firm boundary matter. Right? So firm boundaries and organization structure, all of them can influence opportunity costs and, and both within and outside the, uh, the firm, right? So I want to conclude just uh, uh, allow me to have um, one, one more minute to uh, just to conclude, so uh, the future research, right? So one is that, uh, as I see in the chat, right? So Mario, you know, raised some questions. I, I think, you know, for corporate strategy scholars in our interest group, right? So definitely we should actually need more work on the fundamental questions and concepts, right? So one idea is a little bit of formal modeling, right? So helps a lot because, you know, when you write down, it can clarify a lot of matters. Right. The second, actually, the rest, right, it's all about empirical possibilities. Right? For example, resource reallocation, think about the, you know, 9-11, uh, think about the pandemic, especially think about the new work design nowadays across time and space, right, and globalization, deglobalization, regionalization, all involving resource allocation. And I already touched upon this, better data and measures. And new phenomena, right? So digitalization, you know, etc. Uh, so again, a little bit of advertisement for for our special issue, right? So that's in fact SMJ uh, is calling for this special issue. You know, Kathy, Dan, and Brian Silverman, and myself are co-editing it, right? So the idea is to encourage. Uh, this type of uh, empirical research, right, to overcome the challenges in the past and then leverage the modern technology, the modern data possibilities to push this literature uh, forward. All right, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, these were fantastic presentations. And um, for everyone who's joined us, please feel free to write your questions in the chat or use the raise hand function um, so that we can ask them to the panelists. Um, but I just wanted to kick off the discussion uh, where you left off, Brian, you were talking about some of the changes that we're seeing and um, particularly through the pandemic and other, other things happening. And I, I would like to get your and Tim's thoughts about the role of technology and how technology may be changing what we've seen in the past with resource reallocation and, and maybe theoretically how it's influencing some of our models. So just as an example, um, uh, uh, Publicis Group uh, has a platform that they use for their talent. And so human resources don't have to physically move, um, but they shift across units and functions as far as what they're doing. So temporally, they could be reallocated faster. Um, and, um, and then also, you know, they, they kind of circumvent some issues with regulations and stuff. And so I was wondering, you know, there, there's more than just this one uh, anecdotal example that, that's happened and that we've seen with the pandemic. And I'm just wondering your take, does it change anything about some of the theories that we've had um, and some of the assumptions that we, we've we held in this stream of literature? Uh, yeah, yeah, Kim, sorry, <laughs> let me uh, just quickly mention something because 
again, a disclaimer, I'm not representing my co-editors, you know, all that. But what you described exactly which, what we try to induce, right? So for the strategy field through spe this special issue. So again, apologize for another advertisement. Right on. Tim, please. Well, that's a great question. I, I my first, I'm open to discuss this actually, but my first inclination is to think that, um, you know, for example, the things you mentioned, Katie, seem to what I would characterize as lower adjustment costs, uh, which um, so it doesn't fundamentally change the theory. It plays into the theory, but it might influence the decision to redeploy or not, because in this case, switching costs are reduced just as uh, regulatory changes. You know, if, if a state or a country changes employment protection laws, that you know that will change things quite a bit in terms of the incentives to to redeploy so that, that's my first inclination is to think it just um you know it it doesn't alter the calculus but but the um you know the decision is is um, uh, impacted by um by that particular change brian uh, yeah fully agree and uh, Along the same lines, uh, you know, I would say that this kind of a perfect setting for dissertation, right? The, uh, or for multiple top uh, publications. You know, people like me, I would almost accept it right away, right? So, but on the other hand, I think uh, to me, uh, again, personal taste, right? So, so it's almost like an opportunity to also clarify what's new and uh, what's in terms of theoretical constructs, whether as Tim mentioned, right? So, really, fundamentally the same or they are not the same, right? So for example, maybe in the, let's say modern days, the digital platform, indeed fundamentally, for example, change the scaling factor, you know, from dimensional returns or concave to convex, who knows, right? So maybe there is also some qualitative uh, change, right? So if that's the case, I think there's op also opportunity to, to, to really uh, nail it down, right? So that's how, why I mentioned a little bit of formal modeling, right? And just write a few lines of equation to clarify whether they are indeed the same or, or different. I, I think that's a wonderful opportunity. Yeah, just, just to follow on, I mean, this, this, the pandemic was certainly an interesting time period. And in and, and that situation, you saw companies like, um, you know, car companies like, um, Ford and GM manufacturing PP&E, you know, which is quite distant <laughs> from what they typically do. And so we generally think, well, the closer, you know, uh, you know, these opportunities are, the, the more related the resource uh, requirement. So there must be high switching costs to start making PP&E, but at the same time, there weren't any uh, in inducements to continue with what they were doing. I mean, they, People think about that as a, you know, as a corporate philanthropy move, but it may have been a perfectly rational <laughs> redeployment decision because, um, because that's where the, you know, the inducement was. All right, great. Um, I see that we have a question in the chat by Pablo. And so uh, now I think what we're gonna do is we will enable it so that the participants can ask their questions to the speakers. And so uh, Pablo, would you like to ask a question? Yes, thank you both. Great presentations, I learned a lot. Um, so my question is about uncertainty uh, within uh, the opportunity cost within the firm. It seems that when you have, when you don't know what is the opportunity cost of the resources you use, does that immediately imply that the allocation will be inefficient? Is that something that, that people have thought about or is something that, that we really don't know much? That's my question. Thank you. I, I'll let uh, Tim uh, actually answer it because Tim and Arcady uh, did a number of papers on uncertainty. Yeah, I, I don't, I guess I don't understand the question, Pablo, I'm sorry. So can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So the question is, we have resources within the firm, right? And we need to decide where to deploy them or allocate them. Mm -hmm. But we don't know exactly what is the foregone value of the resources if we move, let's say, from one business unit to another. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we have uncertainty about that value, 
that foregone value, the opportunity cost, mm -hmm. does that entail that decisions will be inefficient or there might be a mechanism through which those um, uncertainty does not affect the efficiency of the firm? Does that clarify the question? Well, you know, it, uh, it does. Thank you. I understand better now, you know, and I guess I would draw the distinction between types of uncertainty. Um, you know, if it's exogenous, um, you know, the, the firm doesn't have control. They can't reduce the uncertainty by action. Whereas if it's endogenous, they can, they can take action to reduce the uncertainty. So, um, so in your particular question, I think the answer is, well, no, it, it, it you know, if it's exogenous uncertainty, it, do, it doesn't necessarily mean that allocation is going to be inefficient because, uh, you know, firms going to make the best decision they can, given the, you know, given the, um, you know, the knowledge that, that exists. Um, uh, in the case of endogenous uncertainty, it's less, it's less clear. Uh, and that's probably a longer discussion. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, we have a question by Aldona in the chat. Aldona, did you wanna raise your question? Sure, hi everyone. So this was such a great um, overview of this literature, thanks so much. I want to counter, Tim, what you said about car makers not uh, having closely related resources. Actually, some of them uh, were using their ventilation and cooling systems from car seats to make respirators. So that was a very interesting discovery that I made. Um, I'm wondering about um, the, the value that resources have when we redeploy them in a new setting and we discover that actually they serve a very different purpose than they did in the initial domain. And I'm thinking here of Gino Catani's work on repurposing and kind of discovery of perhaps even new value for resources that for whatever reason were first uh, deployed in, a, in an initial uh, domain, perhaps for a path dependency or other reasons. So I wonder how you think about this. Thank you. Yeah. Well, just real quickly, uh, I, I, th I think um, that you're raising a super important issue. Um, you know, I, I think we need to do much more thinking about how a firm might make temporarily inefficient decisions but in the long term, they, they may pay off uh, in the sense that you might develop a capability you, you wouldn't otherwise have, or you might you know, be exposed to a market you might not otherwise have. And so my view on corporate strategy is that we're, you know, we're, we're not very temporarily aware. We're, you know, we're thinking about, well, does it make sense for the firm to have multiple businesses? Well, it, it, it depends on future value and, um, and some of that future value is capabilities that can be generated. Um, so, so it's possible you might, you might make a bad decision in the short term, but in the longer term, it may pay off. Um, I, don't, I don't know if Brian wants a ch chance at that. But. Uh, yeah, so I, First of all, you know, I, I, I thank you for this question. Uh, in fact, Gino and I are pretty close. He always claimed that he records me into a PhD program at Wharton uh, as a PhD <laughs> representative on the admission committee. So, so we, we talk all the time. So, so here, I would say that, um, you know, first of all, I really like uh, his work and, and all this. But on the other hand, I think uh, it, it would be useful to, you know, think through whether we are creating just another term, right? So I'm not denying the possibility that repurpose is, uh, you know, uh, very interesting, especially from an innovation perspective, because here it's not like, a, oh, you, let's say you have a, let's say one existing technology, one existing engineer, and then you just reallocate. But uh, I think what you point out is that uh, also, right, there is some kind of recombination, right? Some kind of innovation involved, right? So that it can be repurposed, right? It's not a simple reapplication, right? So that's just the very important. At the same time, uh, I mean, to me, you know, my bias always is that, uh, you, you know, try to be abstract, try to be 
uh, analytical, right? In the sense that at the fundamental level, right? Whether that involves, for example, since we talk about opportunity cost and allocation, right? That they involve, let's say, before the repurpose, right? So, or, or after the repurpose, whether the current business is in, in, uh, affected negatively, or could it be even positively, right? Because there can be some kind of, a, you know, as I said, right? So new recommendation possibilities. So absolutely, I think that that's very important, but I always caution, right? So when we introduce a new, uh, uh, term, right? So be very careful. You know? So, so it, very often I also notice the reviewers, you know, they tend to, you know, always push back when you introduce a new term. Uh, again, I mean, just my personal opinion, right? So maybe that's why I'm a social loser, right? So, so I, I tend to disagree, but I disagree for good uh, intentions. You know? Okay, great. So um, I believe we have time for one more question. Um, so, so you guys have spoken a lot about some of the, the advantages and the desirability to redeploy. And I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what we know about some of the, the downsides of, of redeployment mm -hmm. and, and in thinking about it. Yep. Right. Uh, you know, the downside, I think, in the first order question is, again, this is just the, off the top of my head, right? So I, I think that like a manager is probably sometimes overly confident about their ability to redeploy mm -hmm. resources, right? When it's actually better <laughs> for the market to redeploy, right? So, so, so that very often lead to value disruption. Right. Uh, going back to you know uh, Adam Smith's invisible hand versus Chandler's visible hand. Now, which hand actually uh, more uh, valuable in terms of in terms of creating more value for the society? You know, I, to me, that that'd be a pitiful. Yeah, just a thought on that. That's a great question. I mean, Gwen Lee and and I did some interviews when we wrote this paper with Mervin um, when we studied the telecommunications industry. And what we learned in the interviews was a little bit troubling. They, they, these these uh, managers certainly recognize the opportunity to redeploy uh, upon poor performance or exit, but they did not seem to recognize, they didn't factor it into their calculus uh, upon entering uh, a, a, an industry. And so, you know, maybe it's, um, Maybe it's too complex, or maybe there are behavioral biases that, that make people want to focus on success and, and not, not failure. Um, but, but, I mean, our theoretical work clearly shows that it should lower the entry threshold, but our interviews did not seem to, to coincide with that. So that's, you know, that's one reaction to what you asked, Katie. That's really interesting. Um, we have one more question from Mario. Hi there. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, hi there. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know if we have time for this, but I think Brian touched on it earlier. Thanks so much, by the way, Tim and Brian and the organizers. Um, so, yeah, I've always been somewhat uh, puzzled by, by, by the terminology, right? So if, and I, I do think it's important. So if we define synergy as, you know, the value of two activities or, or resources being greater than the sum of the, of the resources independently, then um, wouldn't resource reallocation be a part of synergy? Um, the, you know, the intratemporal and intertemporal Economies of scope are, are both synergy. No, I I I just like your your take on that because I I tend to still invoke that concept quite a bit, and I'm not sure if I should. <laughs> yeah, you know I I I think you're right. I think we need to be careful about our terminology. Um, I I think. Do you have a problem, Mario, with the way Helfat and Eisenhart defined or distinguished between intertemporal and, and intratemporal? No, no, not at all. I, I don't either. And, and I, you know, 
that's what I was trying to convey. Uh, and I may have been a little loose with how I define synergy, but, uh, but uh, I adhere to that definition. I find it useful. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm similar. So I, 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 I'm with you, uh, Mario. I think um, maybe that's just the terminology issue, right? So uh, I, 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 uh, yeah, whether you call that intertemporal economies as synergy as well, right? Um, um, but uh, yeah, I think it's very important for the field, right? To be clear, right? To, to, to utilize a very a few lines of equation right, to clarify or example, right? So mm -hmm. super helpful, yeah. Thank you, thanks so much. Thank you. Great, well, I realize now that we are, we are officially out of time. And so I wanna give a special thank you to our panelists, Tim and Brian. It, it has been really great. You guys had a wonderful presentation. This has been a great discussion and we really appreciate you taking the time to join with us here today and give this masterclass on resource reallocation. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And Brian, it's a pleasure. Thank you.